Good morning, sorry, good morning. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to um, the fourth Rebuilding Macroeconomics Exit Strategy Workshop. Um, we have a star-studded list uh, for you this afternoon to talk about a fascinating area um, of uh, private sector debt resolution, which can come in many forms. And this is particularly interesting because actually in 2008, 2009, when we did the last crisis, this was actually something that was quite uh, widely discussed uh, in the corridors of power. So this is, although it's very unusual, it's not something that people are, uh, um, uh, haven't considered quite carefully before. I'm, uh, as I said, this is the fourth in our series of workshops. We have another workshop um, next Wednesday, which will be ran by Roger Farmer and Megan Green uh, on uh, monetary finance in an age of coronavirus. For today's workshop, I'm delighted to pass over to Rosa Lastra, who is Professor of um, uh, Banking Law and Finance at Queen Mary at the University here in London. And she's also a consultant to a number of uh, institutions. I won't run to them all, but they do include the ECB, the IMF, um, the Federal Reserve, and so on. And Rose is also one of the grant holders at Rebuilding Macroeconomics. So she runs a project with us. Um, so we're absolutely delighted that she has uh, been kind enough to chair this meeting. So Rose, I'm gonna pass it over to you to run the meeting and I wish you all an excellent workshop. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Angus. Thank you very much, Richard. And thank you very much to the National Institute for convening what I think is a very timely and necessary seminar or rather webinar. And also thank you for the participants, the panelists in the seminar for agreeing to contribute this afternoon or this morning for those that are connecting from the US. And um, as Angus was saying, this is a very important issue it was important even before COVID-19 in the aftermath of the measures that were taken to combat the global financial crisis, some of which were meant to be temporary, but somehow they stuck on and they have created the debt problem even before the problems that we are now facing with COVID-19. And COVID-19 is really a massive uh, health problem for many countries. And we are holding our hands that it doesn't become the pandemic that it has been in Europe, in countries in Africa or in South America that do not have the health systems or the adequate health systems that we have in more developed countries. But what one of the most worrying things, and, and just, is the balancing act now in opening the economy, is the economic consequences that this is going to have. And what we're going to look today is whether or not there should be private sector debt relief as part of this exit strategy. There are many other issues, and I'm not saying that any of you, as you guide us through your thoughts, philosophical thoughts, legal thoughts, economic thoughts, do not deal with some of the other issues since they are very much interlinked. But the focus should be, should private step, sector debt relief be part of the exit strategy? I have to say before I pass the word to the first speaker, and I will say in a few moments the order that we will follow, that this is not an issue unique to the UK. It's obviously an issue in the US. It's the issue in many other European countries. It's a big issue now for the European Union as it wrestles with its recovery fund. And it's also an issue not just for household debt, company debt. It's also an issue for sovereign debt. There are other initiatives. There was an editorial in the FT yesterday about the impact that this massive pandemic is having on emerging economies and the, and the frightful prospect of many debt restructuring, sovereign debt restructuring. And so we can see that debt, debt relief, debt forgiveness, and what do we do? Should the solution to debt be more debt? Or should we look into some form of transformation, debt equity swaps, or looking further into equity finance? And these are some of the issues that we're going to discuss today. So let me just run you through the order of how we're going to do this. First, we're going to have Alex, and I will introduce briefly his bio in a few minutes, talking a little bit about the philosophical perspective based on his writings and his research and his thinking. Then we will have 
Katharina Pistor, known to us all, and recently published this very wonderful book on the Code of Capital. And then we will have Franklin, and then we will have Rodrigo. At each point, I will be introducing each of you. You will be speaking for around 15 minutes. I will not run the one minute. I will perhaps raise your hand when, if you have passed the 15 minutes, but it will be flexible 15 to 20 minutes. And then we will try, as always with the webinars, the, the, the key thing for the participants is to keep it interactive, interactive among ourselves, but also having in the chat room, so participants, if you have a question, you're now all familiar with the chat feature, you just write your question and I will keep track of those questions and try during the Q&A to bring as many as possible to our speakers. So without further ado, since we want to go to the substance of the subject matter of today's webinar as soon as possible, let me introduce just very briefly, and I will do that for each of the speakers. The first one, Alexander Douglas, who is a lecturer of, uh, at the School of Philosophical, Anthropological and Film Studies at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And he's also a member of the Center for Ethics, Philosophy and Public Affairs and a research scholar at the Global Institute for Sustainable Policy. He has published a book, and some of the thinking of that book will obviously uh, be reflected in his comments today on the philosophy of depth, in which he examines the concept from the perspective of language, history, and political economy. And we thought this was a very good way of, a very fitting way of starting our discussion today. So without further ado, I will pass the word to you. I will put myself on mute because then the quality of the recording and the sound is better. And I will ask the other speakers to do the same while Alex speaks. So Alex, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you so much to Rosa and thank you to Angus for the invitation um, to speak on this. It's a great honor to speak on this very uh, eminent panel kind of intimidating as well, but let's see how I go. I'm, uh, uh, as Rosa said, my subject is history of philosophy. So I don't um, come at this issue from, as a, a, an insider in finance or with any particular expertise on the law. So I thought for that reason, although I have my own personal views, of course, on the question for the panel, whether private debt relief should be part of the coronavirus exit strategy. In my opinion is basically yes. Um, in fact, I, I, you know, I believed in, in debt relief in certain cases before this crisis, but um, rather than explaining my personal opinions, I'll leave it to the experts to discuss that question directly and to talk about the various ways in which this might happen. I have opinions about that as well, which might come out. But what, what I'd like to do is, is give some philosophical framing to the issue. I think that when we ask these questions are hard for us because the concept of debt is uh, confusing to us in a lot of ways. Um, I wrote my book to try to clarify. I think we call a lot of different things debt, we use this blanket term in uh, very diverging ways sometimes. I, I think that in economic models, and to some extent in the broader political economy discussion, we sometimes become enslaved to this image, as Wittgenstein says, a picture holds us captive, and the picture is of debt as this choice problem that an agent kind of makes a decision about whether to shift consumption forward or whether to spend future income or whether to take on risk or something like that. And, you know, they weigh up trade-offs and they make their decision and then we get the consequences. Of course, the reality of debt, and Katarina's book, I think, goes into a lot of detail on this, but the reality of debt is, is much more complicated. That model applies better and worse in different situations. But for, for example, um, a lot of debt that gets generated in the modern financial system isn't really the outcome of a choice by an agent. There wasn't a decisive moment of choice. People just fall into debt. A lot of debt gets created as just arrears or people missing payments going into overdrafts. And sometimes I think 
the attachment to the model of debt as this, this choice problem faced by an agent or agents making a contract together uh, lets us lose sight of that point. I think there, there are instances where policies have been made with the expectation that if you set up strong enough incentives against going into debt, then people will stop doing it. But that overlooks the fact that sometimes people don't decide to go into debt, they just end up there. And often, you know, things like raising interest rates to try to disincentivize people going into debt, you end up um, just driving people further in. So, you know, I mean, I think that the, the philosophical conceptual confusions can uh, feed into the policy discussion in ways that can be better or worse. But I think the argument I want to rehearse now is the argument I made in my book. I, I suppose my book was trying to clear space for the idea that it could be the right thing to do to forgive debts in certain situations. I mean, I hadn't really thought of it as making that argument until I think Angus told me that's what the argument I was making was. And I realized, yeah, I kind of guess it, it sort of is. But my, my thinking goes something like this. If, if you think about a debt as a contract, a promise to repay at some later date, why are you obliged by that contract? So, I mean, you, you can appeal to a principle, the principle of Pactus and Servanda, so the principle that contracts have to be honoured, but um, at least from a philosophical point of view, that's not very satisfying. Uh, Pactus and, you know, a, a, an assertion in Latin is still just an assertion, right? We want to know why, why Pactus and Servanda? Why should contracts be um, binding in this way, in every case? Now, a lot of the literature around the concept of debt, at least within the modern Western tradition, um, treats it as an extension of a promise. Um, often, and especially for, for authors writing in Latin, debitum, um, debt and promise, there wasn't really a distinction made. Often duty as well, you know, these terms are all kind of bound together. And the idea is, well, if you've undertaken a debt, then you've made a kind of a promise and promises are binding which of course of interest drives us to the question, well, why are promises binding in this way? Um, the early modern philosopher, Rafe Cudworth, had a lot of trouble over this question. He thought it can't just be that the simple act of promising uh, creates an obligation as an act of special creation, he said. You make, if, if I just say that I'm going to pay a certain amount in the future or do something in the future, um, how does that create an obligation? If you could just create obligations by saying things are going to happen, then I could equally well bind you. I could just say you're going to pay a certain amount or you're going to do something in the future. Well, why would that create an obligation? And Cudworth thinks that the, the situations are really parallel. The truth is you can't think of a debt contract as an arrangement between two agents on their own, just a creditor and a debtor. It has to involve the whole society. The creation of the obligation involves the whole society. And it, it, kind of I thought it worked in the, in the same way as political authority. So why is it that some people have the authority to tell me what to do and others don't? Well, it's not simply that they're appointed into this role. The justification for them being appointed into this role is the social good that it does. You know, we as a society require certain people to be in positions of authority. We require structures, hierarchies of power. Um, and likewise, we require an institution whereby if a person says they're going to do something, the, another person can have a reasonable expectation that that's going to happen, and that there'll be sanctions for it not happening. So all of this centers on the ultimate social good coming out of this institution whether it's the institution of promising or the institution of debt more specifically. This is why the anarchist thinker William Godwin rejected both political authority and promising. He thought you should, we shouldn't think of promises as obligatory because he thought for the same reason he rejected the arguments that we should have certain people be authorities over others, we should reject a person's authority over their future self. 
He thought these are, these are parallel cases. But the, the point for me is, is that it's all contingent on the social good of the institution. A promise is obligatory because it's better to have people on the whole honor promises than not. And why? Well, because we need to be able to make promises to each other. We need to be able to bind each other without uh, coercion. And if people routinely broke promises, then of course the institution would fail. And so you, you have the same thing with credit. Credit, of course, comes from credere. It's the, it, it, it works on belief. It only exists, a credit institution only exists insofar as there's belief that the obligations people undertake um, will be honored. But to me, this opens up a deeper question then. So if a promise is obligatory or a debt contract is obligatory insofar as the institution of debt is a social good, then we have to ask, well, is the institution of debt always a social good? Is it good in every circumstance? And it seems to me that it, it should be perfectly possible, logically, that in some cases, it will do more social good to cancel debts than to have them be honored. So in other words, the same justification that uh, you give for the obligatoriness of a debt contract can work in other situations as, as a justification for debt cancellation. So if you can show that the debt institutions that we have, if debts are um, allowed to continue accumulating and to continue to bind debtors, if that becomes something that's, that's doing more social harm than social good, then the debt contracts are nullified already, at least in moral terms, just by, by virtue of that very fact. Um, and this is something that, that used to happen all the time in the ancient world, because I think that the, the recognition was that debts can just build up in this way. It's not, a, not necessarily something, as I said, that an agent decides to undertake. You could have debts that just built up because systematically people were falling short of the payments that they need to make were falling into arrears with each other. The debt accumulates like dust on a surface, you know, it's not something that people are deciding to do. So you just have to wipe them clean uh, every so often. So there's of course the famous debt jubilees in the Bible. But I think, you know, all through our culture, there are references to this notion that we've sort of forgotten how to recognize um, in the Lord's Prayer, for example, in one of the versions of the Lord's Prayer, it's forgive us our debts as we forgive the debts of others. And given that the first sermon that Jesus preaches, he turns to um, 61 of Isaiah, which is a declaration of a debt jubilee. It's just one of the many passages in the Hebrew Bible that proclaims a debt jubilee. It seems like that's, that's probably what the original message was, although you know, the message became spiritualized. Another example I've thought of is the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone, everybody knows about it and what it is, not that many people know what it says, but it seems to be, a debt, among other things, a debt cancellation, a declaration of, um, as Ptolemy V was appointed to take over as ruler, as many rulers would periodically do, they, he, would, he was cancelling all the outstanding debts. And the reason for that was when debts progressed past a certain level in the ancient world, they stopped being a way of facilitating commerce, a way of allowing people to make payments at a distance or shift consumption forward, all the different things that you know, were told about in economics textbooks, and started stratifying society into a debtor caste and a creditor caste, because debts had accumulated to the point that they were absolutely unpayable. Um, rates of interest were, were well beyond the income that anyone could hope to earn to service them. And so you had a growing proportion of the population being effectively enslaved to their creditors. In various societies in the ancient world, you have this happening, um, which at some point goes against the public purpose, what we could call the public purpose. And the public purpose, I don't want to, you know, celebrate too much in the ancient world 
that meant the purpose of the rulers. The purpose of the rulers was, well, they needed uh, people to work for them, to do corvée labor for them, to serve in the army, to provide you know, public goods, which often just meant <laughs> goods for the ruler, but still, the, there was a greater social need to get people out of debt bondage, to make them available, to free them up for um, public purposes, than to allow contracts to be honored. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel like there, I don't want to make, draw too many parallels between the ancient world and our current situation. Uh, and like I said, I don't know if I have the expertise to make pronouncements about what situation we find ourselves in. But philosophically speaking, it seems like it's perfectly plausible. There's, it, 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 it's perfectly open to us to say that we might find ourselves in a situation where the social good of demanding that contracts are honored is outweighed by the social good of clearing away toxic debts, you know, debts that are just freezing up the system that, uh, well, the, the op-ed written by Katerina presents many of the consequences of the levels of private debt that we have in our society today. So um, I thought I would just say that by way of, of framing the conversation philosophically. Okay, thank you very much. So we will have now our second speaker. Thank you very much for sticking to the 15 minutes. And uh, we have Katerina Pister joining us from the US. As you all know, Katerina is the Ed Edwin Parker Professor of Comparative Law at Columbia Law School. And she's also director of the Law School Center on Global Legal Transformation. She has written many books and she has written a lot on the interaction between law and economics very powerfully. And her latest book, or oh, I think it's her latest book, The Code of Capital, was named as one of the best business books in 2019 by the Financial Times. And she, um, she contributes to a number of, of organizations and to a number of initiatives, you know, from the Institute of New Economic Thinking to the Network for Institutional Research. But uh, she has a stellar CV, which will take me five minutes just to go through. And rather than doing that, I will give the, the word to her, thanking her very much for making time in her busy schedule to be in this fascinating webinar today. So again, I will mute myself and the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Rosa, for this kind introduction and, and thank you for inviting me to join you today. Uh, it's a great pleasure and I feel really honored to share the panel with so many great colleagues and, and, and friends. So what I wanted to say is I, I agree with the bottom line and I've said this uh, in an op-ed in The Guardian a month ago or so that I think uh, we probably don't have a choice but to do debt relief this time around. And um, I'm not an economist, but I think the economic rationale will be that we have had such a collapse of demand, um, a demand by households who already were excessively in debt before this crisis even started, that in order to revive the economy, we probably have no choice but to um, relieve the debt at least to some extent. So if you just look at sort of recent OECD statistics, you will find that even before the crisis, in the OECD alone, 12% um, were living in relative income poverty, one in four Five had difficulties to make ends meet and more than one third of people in the OECD were at risk of falling into poverty. Many are indebted because I think in, in a number of countries, certainly in the United States, in the UK and others, we have used debt as a substitute for social services or have privatized social services um, and, and, and that thus they have become debt financed. We have created a spiral of debt instruments to fund social provisioning. Think just about pension funds. Um, so pension funds need to, you know, investing into in, in assets, hopefully in, in safe assets to fund our future pensions. And what they've done certainly until the uh, global crisis of 2008, they have invested in mortgage-backed securities, which is a particular debt instrument that was created arguably even in, in part to help um, pension funds to have um, assets that are deemed relatively safe to invest into. So I think we have uh, created certainly since the early 1970s a system that relies excessively on debt, and we have created the legal foundations 
to allow um, uh, private sector um, uh, actors, uh, financial intermediaries, um, whether regulated or not, and of course their lawyers to literally, and I say this in my book, mint debt assets. Um, it's not that hard to do that, right? You just basically create not just a contract, that's sort of the foundation of a commitment to pay in the future, but in our so-called shadow banking system or parallel banking system, we have created a system whereby you back up these contracts with collateral, with assets that can use, be used as a substitute to enforce against. And this collateral it, 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 in, in and of itself can be another financial asset. So we basically can use the tools of law, contracts, collateral, property law, trust, corporate law, and of course bankruptcy law to create claims that are supposedly enforceable in the future in order to fund our current um, needs and wants, but also to, 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 to create a lot of wealth for those who are at the other end of that transaction, namely the creditors. And we have done this to um, a point that is unprecedented historically. And even after the 2008 crisis, when in principle we said we wanted to downscale the, the massive indebtedness, we have started again. So household debt in the US and the UK had just reached new peaks just before this crisis came, came down. Um, and I think many people now find themselves in a position where not only um, have they enormous amounts of debt, but the future for them, the ability for them to repay their debt has fundamentally changed. So unemployment is up dramatically in the United States, uh, maybe less dramatically yet in the UK, but there are estimates that it will reach 20% um, as well, probably over the summer, the same in, in other countries as well. That means for people who have accumulated debt in the past, in the expectation to be either able to, uh, to, to pay them back or to refinance them, the future has changed dramatically because in the future they probably won't have jobs. Um, if they have jobs, they might pay less. Um, and so they will simply not be able to repay their debt. Um, you know, you can make the argument in principle um, on a moral ground, as Alex did, um, about debt and cancelling debt under certain circumstances. I think in, even in economic terms, you can make the point that contracts are incomplete, right? It, always, they're necessarily incomplete. And when you think about the contracts that people ent entered into prior to a pandemic that was clearly unforeseeable for everybody, then there's hardly a better case to say these contracts are clearly incomplete. And the state should intervene. And uh, Patrick Bolton and how Rosenthal made this point in a paper in 2003, the state should intervene to make these contracts complete. And that means to adjust them to current circumstances. I don't think we can do this on a case-by-case -case basis through bankruptcy because the problem is too big and the uh, scale too large. So we have to do this um, in a more top-down fashion. So we need not only debt moratoria, I, I think we not, not only need a temporary relief of the current debt levels that we have, but we do need a restructuring of the debt, a clear debt relief. I think this is important also in, in, uh, in other dimensions. I think the pandemic reminds us and I think gives us a warning shot that the future that we are facing is of course always uncertain, but we now know for certain that it will be more un uncertain than the past has been. And the reason for that, of course, is climate change. So as the future becomes increasingly uncertain, a system that relies excessively on debt especially on debt that has to be refinanced all the time to be sustainable because nobody has the resources to pay down their debt. Such a system is unsustainable and such a system is contrary also to our, I think, ambition to um, deal with, with climate change and sort of um, get our own uh, patterns of life under control that are destroying the environment on which we all depend. So in a way, I think the pandemic also gives us an opportunity to think through much more fundamentally about the kind of financial system and the kind of financing that we can afford given the future that we're facing and giving a deeply um, um, uncertain future that we're facing. Obviously, the, the, the how, how is a big question. Alex alluded to this earlier. How do you do restructuring um, in, in the system? And that has to be done in part, of course, um, in context of different systems, and you have to think about the legal structures and, and the political structures to do so. Um, there are different 
um, ideas on the table. Let me just say that it's, this is not going to be easy. Um, and for the reason that have to do with the way in which we have structured debt relations over the last 40 years or so. So it's not just that the banks are the most important creditors for the private sector and for households, but many, especially at the lower level of the income um, um, stream, they rely on um, uh, getting credits from intermediaries that themselves have hardly any buffers to deal with a situation in which their, um, their debtors don't pay back their loans. So if you think about small and medium-sized business in, in the United States, they're lending from lending platforms that are lightly regulated. They don't have the equity or liquidity buffers to deal with a lot of defaults of their own debtors. So if you give a debt moratorium, even just a debt, debt moratorium or debt relief at the lower end, where you should give it first, I think on moral grounds and on just to, to, to uh, alleviate the stress on the periphery of our system, the house will basically, like a cascade, will fall because the next level it will stress out and, and, and pass on the buck basically to the next level. It will reach the top eventually. And I think the strategy would, would, would have to be to, um, to stop the cascade early on and make sure that we get debt relief uh, structured in such a way that we don't wait until the, the major institutions at the center will be engulfed. I think, again, going back to what, what I said earlier, I truly believe that we need to structure our financial system and become less reliant on debt. Some have put on the table the idea of basically effectively nationalizing certain types of creditors that give mortgages, um, debt finance, so that you basically um, not only give them liquidity support right now or, or bail out the intermediaries that come out on, under stress, but that you put the government in a position to restructure these institutions for the future um, as well. This has to be thought out uh, really carefully, I think in a country by country basis, but we, we need to start thinking along those lines and thinking structurally how to not only deal with the COVID pandemic, but I think much more fundamentally how to provision social goods, whether we do this through credit or credit-based financing of pensions and, and, and other um, institutions or whether we can do this in other form. Um, I should add to that, of course, that if you take credit on a large scale out of the system, future growth prospects will be lower. Um, that's part of the gain because we have relied on credit, of course, to fuel economic growth in the future. Um, but again, in light of, um, of climate change and, and the growing uncertainty that we face, and, um, I think we, we, we hardly have a choice and we should seize the moment now to take the kind of reforms that will put us in a better position to deal with future um, uncertainty. So let me just leave it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katarina. And our third speaker before, well, we still have a fourth and then we will go to Q&A. I will encourage all of you that are listening, if you have any questions that you put them in the chat room, I will then consolidate the questions in the chat room and put them to the speakers. So as, as you hear, the various arguments and ideas come to you, just feel free to send a um, question in the chat room. This is the equivalent in a webinar of when we collect the questions at the end of a seminar, but we will not have that chance, so please do. So uh, Franklin Allen is well known to us all as a professor of finance and economics here in London at Imperial College. He's the author of a number of very well-known books in corporate finance, in financial crisis, comparative financial systems. So it is quite fitting that he's going to be talking to us about some of the financial stability and economic aspects. He's also just, uh, again, uh, a very long uh, biography that will take me five minutes, but I'm just going to summarize some of the key aspects of the many things that he has done and contributed. He's the executive director of the Brevan Howard Center at Imperial College, where he teaches. He's also executive editor of the Review of Financial Studies and managing editor in the Review of Finance. And he was previously with Wharton and also past president of the American Finance Association and a few other associations. But again, in the spirit of brevity of the biography, I will pass the word now to you. And I will, um, again, encourage you to obviously be as critical as you want, as well as constructive in what can be done. And perhaps since you're the one that has a more clear basis in economics, I know Katerina also has a fantastic background in economics, but you work as a professional economist and finance person, perhaps you can also guide us to some of the questions and answers 
of, for instance, you know, what will be the solution in the long run, whether it will be more equity finance, or whether we will reduce debt to higher inflation, or what are some of the economic way outs of this massive crisis. But to begin, you know, your 15 minutes, and perhaps we can come through the Q&A to some of these other more profound and fascinating issues on the post-government, on the exit strategy post-COVID of the government. So I will mute myself. Thank you, Rosa, and thank you to Angus for inviting me to uh, join this, this very interesting panel. Let me just start a little bit with where we're at, and I think that's very important for this question of how much debt finished forgiveness. We are going into a situation which I think at the beginning most people thought wouldn't be too bad, that we would have a lockdown maybe for a few weeks, then uh, infection rates would go down, that the disease would essentially disappear to a large extent, and then we would go back to normal and we'd have this famous V-shaped recovery. Now, the deeper that we get into the crisis, the less likely that that kind of scenario seems to be plausible. So if you look at, say, the recent uh, Bank of England predictions about what's going to happen, we're going to have this massive drop in GDP in the UK, and I think there are many other countries with similar kinds of drops, but maybe 14%. Now, you know, we, we, most of us think of the Great Depression as being this awful event that, that uh, would be, just be terrible. But in fact, you know, the, the number that they're giving, they tell us, is the worst for 300 years. So then we think, okay, so what happened 300 years ago, which was equally bad? Well, there was a story in the FT a few days ago which explained that this was the great frost of 1709. And this was the coldest winter for 500 years. And for those of you who, who've lived in Central Europe or the Central US or Canada, it wasn't very cold. It was like 10 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 12 centigrade. So, but that caused a drop in GDP comparable 15, 16%. Now, that, that's pretty bad. Um, the question is, is that a reasonable estimate or not? They then went and had a V-shaped recovery in a couple of years. And I think that the problem is the deeper we get into this, the more problematic everything becomes. So we recently had this week in the UK, this description of the roadmap out. And the problem is that I don't think people have taken into account the effects of social distancing and quite how that, that filters through. So when you listen to it, the first thing you realize if you live in London is we're all gonna have a huge problem getting to work because if many people commute on trains and buses. And you know the advice to walk or to take the bicycle it's, it's not very helpful if you live 20 miles away or many people do 50 miles away. And so, you know, you can take cars, but that, you know, it's already pretty much gridlock. So that's a big problem. And we're going to be in this for at least a year, they say, with the vaccines. Now, that also, you know, the, the, the uh, original view was, well, it's take a year to 18 months to get a vaccine. But turns out that vaccines are actually very difficult to make. And so, for example, one of the things that I hadn't realized uh, until Boris Johnson mentioned it recently is there isn't a SARS vaccine. SARS is at least 15 years old and they've been looking for a vaccine. They didn't find one. So it's not entirely clear that we're going to have a vaccine. And then there are all the other issues going forward. So it's not so clear that it's going to be this quick lockdown, come out and everything OK. And somebody from WHO, who's a senior person there, was thinking it'd be at least four or five years. So one of the issues is, so how long is it gonna be and how much debt are people gonna have? And one of the big issues is unemployment. Katerina had already mentioned that. In the US, places like the Peterson Institute are predicting 20%. In the UK, we don't get such high predictions, but that's because the public sector's taken on the, the 
effort with the furlough scheme. So we have 7 million people who are getting paid effectively by the government 80% of, of what they earned before, which is a huge number. So we'll soon, as Katarina said, be the similar kind of, of number. But that's just the first round because the longer these things happen, the more bankruptcies there are going to be and the more problems, the scarring of the economy, as people now call it, that there are going to be. So, you know, I think the first issue is how, how bad will it be? And it's, it's quite possible, even maybe probable, that it's going to be at Great Depression kinds of levels of unemployment. We're not far off 25%. Uh, even with the, the, the kind of modest predictions that people are making for a few months ahead. So, so that's a big problem because for huge sectors of the economy, if people, the firms go bankrupt and, and so forth, people uh, are not going to have jobs and that very quickly runs into whether they're going to, to be able to continue. Now, if you look at the safety nets, even in Europe, let alone in the US where safety nets tend to be temporary and not, not uh, very long lasting, that's a big problem because these are fairly, fairly minor. Many people don't have savings and so on. So I think that that's a big issue. How bad is it going to be? Now, I think debt forgiveness, I would agree with, with um, both Alex and, and Katarina. I think this is a good thing in, in, in small amounts. I think, you know, for, for um, many consumers, which is much, about much, much of what the discussion was about, it makes sense with this big shock to have debt forgiveness. But the problem that that raises is who is going to take the hit and what are the other kinds of um, effects that that's going to have? And I think that's where we start getting into trouble and this issue of financial stability and so forth co comes up. So, you know, one, one answer to that is, well, the government should take the hit. And, and that's effectively what's happening in the UK. We had this extension of the furlough scheme, but, but the amounts of debt that they're taking on are eye-watering. So, you know, the, um, a few, two months ago in the budget, the amount of public sector borrowing was 50 to 60 billion pounds. Now they're talking about 330, 350, if it goes higher, we, you know, people have started talking about half a trillion pounds of debt. That's a, roughly speaking 25% of GDP a couple of years ago. Th these are enormous amounts. Now, you can say, well, that's fine. We can do that. It's a one-off. We won't have this one, one in a hundred year event very often. And so we can do that. But the problem is if it goes on one, two, three years, it's going to be difficult for the government to take that kind of debt on. So then you, you can't say, say, well, what about the individuals? And this is where we get to this sort of social inequality problem. You know, at the moment, the people who are suffering are basically people who are poor and have insecure incomes. And so um, debt forgiveness for many of those people seems to me a good idea. Now, as you go up the income scale, then, then you start getting into more problems because it's going to be a bigger, a bigger issue and, and potentially cause more problems. But let me move on because it's not just consumers. We've also got small businesses and medium-sized enterprises, and those also are very important and very vulnerable, but they, they employ a lot of people too. So what are we going to do about that? Do we want to give that, forgive their debts? And that's would be an even bigger uh, drain on the government. So we've got a lot of gov government guarantees of, of debt. The question is how do you value those? But if things get really bad, they, they're going to be called in. And again, we have that issue. And then, of course, we have corporations. So many major corporations who we think of being as somewhat iconic are at, at risk. So, you know, there's a large sections of the economy which are basically not operating at all at the moment. It's not clear when they're going to come back. So you think of the aviation sector, for example, the airlines, the um, people that uh, make planes, so you know, Boeing and so on. So that, that's, that's a big problem too. Do we want to get the, give debt for them? Should we bail them out? So underlying all that is, is issues of sovereigns and guarantees. This is about private sector debt, but 
you know, I think sovereign debt is, is an interesting um, issue too, because that's what comes on the, the screen if you have the social insurance, which I think is very important. I mean, I, I agree with Patrick and Howard that, that, that it is good for the government to, to, um, to uh, complete contracts, but there, there are limits to what the government can do. And I think the other issue is, is this financial stability one. So at the moment, what the central banks say is, well, we, we put in all these regulations after the great financial crisis, and they're, they're doing fine. They've got big equity buffers and so on relative to what they had. But a real question is, what, what are the valuations of assets? So, you know, one of the things we saw at the beginning was a huge drop in equity values, uh, particularly in the U.S., but then we've had a huge recovery. So you know, if you go back two or three days, the market was not down much at all. And this is looking into a future where we're looking at something like the Great Depression. And maybe that's because they believe in, in a V-shaped uh, recovery. The other view is that it, central banks now intervene so much in the financial system that they effectively control prices of assets and that the prices themselves don't mean that much anymore. And that is also very worrying in a number of different ways. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, you know, if you look at the oil market, we saw that that's a market where there isn't that much intervention, despite what OPEC and so on do. And we've seen a complete collapse in, in, in the value of oil. Now, what does all this mean for the financial system? Well, again, if, it, if these move, if these price movements are small, then we'll be fine. That there won't be financial instability. Some debt forgiveness, particularly for poor people, is a very good idea. But the more that we get into a huge depression when we actually need it the most, the more difficult it's going to be. Because if we start having debt forgiveness, and for example, it's the banks that take the hit, then we have a financial stability problem. And as we saw in, in uh, the 2007 to nine crisis, that on its own causes further problems. So that's potentially a bigger hit. There are other big issues like insurance companies. So insurance companies, for example, have many guarantees in, that they've introduced in the last few years. That's essentially become their role. Um, if you read Ralph Coyan and uh, uh, Motoyogo's work on that, what do we do about that? Well, debt forgiveness there may be a good idea because those guarantees are high. And if you look at what they did in Japan after many of the insurance companies had 5% guarantees and interest rates went down to zero, they essentially did a, a, a debt forgiveness plan. You didn't have to, they didn't enforce the contracts anymore. So th there are some issues like that. So um, the other issue is pension funds. I mean, you know, pension funds are already in big trouble because of zero and negative interest rates. We now have potential equity collapses and so on. So uh, that's another issue. What, where, where do we, what do we do about that? So I think, as I say, there are significant problems about debt forgiveness. In the long run, it would be great if we could have all contingent contracts. That's you know, the economist's solution to this problem. But they're problematic. They, the, more, you know, the reason we use debt so, uh, so much is it's pretty cheap to use. You don't have to have too many costly court cases unless we have bankruptcy and so on. If you think of equity, we have to have a whole mechanism of, of accounts verification of those and so on and the same is true with many of the interim contracts of state contingency so let me uh, conclude I'm coming towards the end of my 15 minutes but I think definite forgiveness is good I think there are situations where it's very helpful it should be directed to be towards people who can take it uh, who sorry who can't uh, survive without it so poor people the government can take some. They can't take unlimited amounts, though, and the, the amounts of debt they're taking are very huge. The bigger those get, the more problems we're going to have in the future. And then the financial system, if 
this takes a long time and is long lived and we have lots of problems can also be a pro big problem because they're not well placed and again Katerina mentioned this they're not well placed to take these hits despite all the reforms we've had so I think we have to think hard about who we give the de debt forgiveness to and precisely how much we we use of that and let me stop there thank you very much Franklin for this interesting reflections on the implications for the economy and financial stability. We will come back to some of those during the Q&A. And I will now go for the, the, our last speaker today before we commence a dialogue with Amon Us and, and also with, with the people that are contributing as participants to this seminar. And that's my colleague Rodrigo Olivares Caminal, eh, who teaches what I teach at the Center for Commercial Law Studies at Queen Mary University of London. He's a professor of banking and finance. And as you all know, he's a renowned expert on sovereign debt, as well as issues of debt generally. He has acted as sovereign debt expert for UNTA, a senior insolvency expert for the World Bank and IFC, and as a consultant to several multilateral institutions in the US and Europe, as well as central bank and sovereign states. He has written extensively in the field of international finance and insolvency law. And he recently also published in his, in his LinkedIn page uh, uh, um, something related to the subject that we're talking today, which he called a legal bazooka, which he co-wrote with another lawyer. And uh, Rodrigo will be talking mostly to some of the legal issues. Can I just say before he starts and also before we get to the Q&A, that though the title of the seminar is Should Private Sector Debt Relief Be Part of the Exit Strategy? It did not mean that the National Institute is advocating necessarily debt forgiveness. It is more that we are discussing the pros and cons of such an approach, as well as a measure take on the solutions, alternative solutions, to avoid excessive reliance on the current procedures. So we're also looking at imaginative solutions, and Franklin Allen mentioned the, the Great Depression. And one of the interesting things of the Great Depression is that there was a great deal of imagination in the New Deal in coming up with figures, with legislation that eventually got the US both out of the crisis and hopefully on a stronger platform than it was before. So as much as this is a crisis, as is often said, it also presents an opportunity to remedy some perhaps of the mistakes that we have been accumulating over the years, whether it's an understanding of debt or an understanding of insolvency proceedings. And that is fitting for Rodrigo to start talking about his thoughts, since he has written a lot about insolvency proceedings at the domestic and international sovereign level. So Rodrigo, the floor is all yours. I will mute myself. Rosa, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for the opportunity to be presenting today in this interesting webinar. I would like uh, to start by stating some general underlying uh, issues, which is when we're talking about debt, we need to see this as a multidimensional problem because to start with, uh, there are four, in my view, clear categories. One is personal debt corporate debt, banking, or more generally the financial sector debt, and then sovereign debt. So basically, this is, this for me are the four dimensions, and each one of them needs to be treated differently because each one of them poses different risk, threats, and to an extent, each one of them is ruled by a different set of norms. Then, the other thing that we need to bear in mind is that debt is uh, mostly intertemporal in the sense that uh, most of the debt that is being borrowed today will be paid tomorrow and most likely by uh, not, not necessarily but on, on many instances by someone else particularly that applies mostly to government debt or to the corporate debt that uh, has a long maturity date and then the other thing, and something that uh, has not discussed uh, much before, uh, particularly in this webinar, is the issue that basically debt, uh, because everybody's talking about debt forgiveness, but we need to bear in mind that debt has 
two sides to it. It's basically, it's not just a poor debtors, they cannot honor their obligations. We need to give a debt forgiveness upfront because basically the other side is that the government money at the end of the day is taxpayers money, uh, funds money who have invested in, in some of these uh, funds, uh, companies, uh, governments, etc. Basically, this is uh, pensions money, this is widows and orphans money. So basically, by giving an outright debt forgiveness, we will be indirectly affecting others. So basically, there are two sides of when we talk about uh, debt forgiveness. Uh, there, are, there are consequences uh, on the other side of the equation, because basically that money that is being forgiven is someone else's money. Uh, and, and some of them is people that have uh, put their entire life savings uh, in uh, a particular investment, and that investment has been used to finance some of these uh, uh, monies that have been lent. And the other element that we need to finally bear in mind is that I am a uh, I have also an additional perspective as I come myself from a developing country and I have witnessed, uh, so, uh, and not only I have witnessed it personally uh, from where I come from, but also uh, nowadays working, working closely also with many developing countries, the, the issue of a uh, moral hazard that uh, uh, a broad blanket uh, that forgiveness can, can create. So basically, uh, what I want to talk is a little bit more on the pragmatic side and looking at uh, the legal element of this. So basically, we have seen past measures to save countries from the potential fatal economic and financial shocks that we have experienced. What we have witnessed is an economic intervention without precedent. Uh, governments have, in recent days, opened the tabs to get uh, the much needed cash into operating businesses, uh, making sure that the money reach employees, bottom line, uh, into the real economy. This has been largely done by a cascading grants and government back loans. And this is not just the case in the UK, but basically most of other developed OECD economies have opted for same or similar urgent and extreme measures. And this is a, a broken arrow moment for the UK economy uh, because we are facing the worst combined health, economic, and financial crisis that we have ever witnessed. And the main issue, the main problem that we are facing is that it's taking down all businesses, not just the weak or the liquid or the liquid ones, and uh, there were some references before to to the to the to the previous crisis with the collapse of Lehman, and and, and again that one was uh, a sectorial crisis that affected the financial sector. This one is affecting all sectors alike. So uh, why do we need some kind of radical approach? Is basically because we have seen the vast economic measures that have been adopted and I think that there is scope for a similar extraordinary legal steps that need to be taken to back this economic intervention. Basically, to facilitate the immediate successful implementation and remove mainly legal impediments, uh, delays, mainly any red tape that can prevent the money to reach in the people that they need it when they need it the most. So basically the main aim is we need legal clarity, we need legal certainty, and we need simplicity above all to be allow us to overcome the current mayhem. So what we need to make sure is that CEOs, CFOs, boards of directors, and senior executive management, all of them can focus on what's more important now, which is safeguarding the interest of all stakeholders rather than looking into what are the legal requirements or what does the black letter of the law say. So basically, what is of utmost importance now and has been happening so far, but not everywhere, is the access to liquidity through the creation of significant indebtedness, 
covenant breaches, uh, rating downgrades, and director duty. So basically, we need to, uh, for some time, disregard this altogether. And that's why I was referring to the need to create a legal bazooka. And this legal bazooka is just basically a suspensions act that needs to focus on pre-pandemic and post-pandemic debts. For pre-pandemic debt, because many of these companies and uh, companies, individuals, sovereigns, what we need to bear in mind is that some of them are already carrying uh, some debt forward. And basically, this is debt that they have incurred without the risk of a pandemic, without foreseeing the consequences of, of a pandemic. So basically, we need to freeze enforcement rights for a period of six, nine, 12 months probably even extend this if needed to make sure that they can regain access to the required cash flow to be able to honor debt obligations. On the post-pandemic debt, uh, in my view, it should be a pre-pandemic debt plus. What I mean is suspension of enforcement rights, but also suspension of some of the uh, rights are, or metrics that are used in the law as to, for example, what the test of solvency, what are the rights of duties, all this uh, aiming at allowing the people I was referring before, CEOs, CFOs, management, board of directors, to be able to do whatever it takes to get their business through the current crisis. And then basically uh, establishing a rolling two to five year reverse, reversal or unfreezing period for the economy to re return to normality. Of course, be, depending on the needs, this can be shortened or extended. And also establishing and confirming a, a backstop or an indemnity facility uh, from the government in favor of banks to foster lending Allowing, allowing banks to execute the provision of some of these helicopter money and preventing uh, the emergence of any lockdown. And once the UK economy is safe, uh, the financial ecosystem of bankers, lawyers, accountants, consultants, finance directors, uh, professional advisors, they can figure out a pragmatic fashion to repaper the entire system uh, of this uncharted new world. Another important element uh, that we need to consider is the fact that uh, we will need simpler, faster, and more pragmatic uh, insolvency tools that will allow for quicker and hassle-free restructurings. And I am convinced that some of these needs to be done uh, either completely out of court, of course, going through a court to, to make sure that the minimum requirements are met, there have been no abuses, but also simplified regimes for small and medium-sized enterprises. So just to, to wrap up and um, my main takeaways, uh, I am happy to enlarge on some of these proposals then in the Q&A, but basically, uh, the private sector needs to be part of the solution. Yes, definitely yes. Uh, providing forbearance, that means interest holidays, extending maturities, and uh, trying to assist in finding uh, solutions together with the debtor. Uh, and outright debt forgiveness. Uh, <clears throat> I am a minority uh, in this webinar, but I am uh, opposed to uh, an outright debt forgiveness. Uh, that will, in my view, will undermine the rule of law. And we need to, to remember that basically the financial sector, which will be the one who will be uh, financing the recoveries, uh, is built on promises. And, and, and what we need to bear in mind, and I think that that's something very precious and something which has not been uh, spoken much about is the fact that by the time that the pandemic is over and then the, the time that we need to start rebuilding the whole ecosystem, uh, the, the issue is that many of the institutional lenders will have depleted the resources. 
So that's when we will need the most, the, the, the key role that the private sector will be there to play. So that's why basically I think that basically they need to be part of the solution more than just uh, impose a solution on them. And Rosa, I will leave it there for now and, and I'm happy to discuss about some of the other proposals that uh, we can discuss about, uh, for example, the, the inclusion of interest holidays, GDP link instruments, etc. But I, I leave it for there now, uh, there now. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, and thank you very much to all our panelists today. And how we're going to do now is that I'm going to be posing some questions. We have had an active chat during the presentation that you may have been looking into. And I'm just going to be putting some questions to you. And to make it more interactive, when, when you have the opportunity to talk, may I also encourage you to take it to respond to the other speakers. You know, part of having a webinar is to facilitate also the interaction between the speakers. And so not only answer my question, but anything else that you think that you either agree or disagree in what the other speakers were saying. So the, the, the first question, which is a question that has been put by some, uh, at least two of the people that have been talking in the, in the chat, and which in a way goes to the point that Rodrigo finished his presentation with, is the, the correct balance in terms of debt relief and moral hazard. So how do you reconcile the apparent need to cancel debt, to provide debt relief, debt forgiveness, with the need to prevent a moral hazard going forward? Something which obviously in the literature in banking and finance is extensive, but is an important issue going forward. So I will put just this question and, and I will ask first, follow the same order, Alex, Katarina, but you can raise your hand like this or raise your hand in the, in the feature, and just tell me that you want to say something. But not only answer the question, but be it an opportunity to agree, disagree, and discuss any of the points that the other speakers have said, since you obviously have not had an opportunity to do so during the webinar so far. So first of you, Alex. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so you get moral hazard when you cancel debts and then leave the system uh, uh, as it was before, right? Because then people realize, oh, okay, it doesn't, doesn't work the way that we thought it did. Uh, some people can get out of their debts. So, I mean, I think this has been coming up in the discussion as well. I, I, obviously what goes with debt forgiveness on a big scale is also a reform of the credits. I mean, you really are starting over. You're not just clearing the debts away and then letting the same thing happen again, except now with the added risk of, of uh, debt cancellation being priced in. Um, but I, you know, I think so, so. This has to be an opportunity to think about what it is that gets us into this situation. So first of all, I'd like to pick up on something that Katarina pointed out, which is the idea that debt, um, especially household debt, has become a replacement for the welfare system in a lot of places. You know, so I, I call it stealth fare. Basically, you you cut the welfare budget, you get all these accolades from the population for doing that, but you know the people who are receiving the welfare still need to survive, so they they fall into debt. And then uh, people holding these assets realize that the value of these assets is going to collapse. So we can't let that happen because, you know, that's also how we provision our old age care system is by having pension funds invest in assets that, you know, have to hold the value. So what eventually happens is the state holds up the value of the assets by either just buying them outright or repoing them through central banks or all these different techniques that we have. But effectively, it means that you know you get back to where you started ultimately you just have the state paying for this shortfall in income for people who weren't able to support themselves on the income they were earning it's just a more it, it's a more deceptive way of of uh state provisioning so you know i, I think that, that that's not a sustainable a, a long-term sustainable thing i'm not I, I wouldn't advocate continuing to run our system of social provision in this way but the first step to doing something else is to get rid of these debts that we've that we've accumulated by by letting the system run in this way. A couple of other things, um, just responding to the other speakers. Um, this question that Franklin asked about how much debt the government can take on. It's, I mean, it's certainly true that if you started writing down debts, uh, 
the immediate hit would be taken by whoever was holding on to these assets. Although I should say the different agents in the economy have different abilities to, to um, push these costs onto somebody else. I know one thing that's happening in Australia is banks, in addition to making these big, terrifying looking loss provisions that they're doing, they're also paying out loads of dividends, right? That's just exploitation of the, um, the you know, dividends are supposed to be excess profits um, being paid. Well, of course, they're not making excess profits. What they're realizing is their equity is about to run down. So better to pay it out to people now who can then buy houses with it or, you know, something that the government can't take from you when the bank, uh, in case the bank goes under. But in any case, uh, yeah, you, you, you need, I guess, if you're going to be intervening on the scale, you need the state to take on the initial burden and then to decide who's going to wear it. So, I mean, in terms of whether the government can bear the cost, well, the government uh, can take on debt and, uh, you know, or, or either guarantee debt or, you know, put in long-term refinancing arrangements or whatever. But then, then the question arises of, well, who are you going to put this cost onto? Where in the tax base are you going to put the cost, you know? But that, I mean, that seems like a, a way to collectively make the decision uh, about who should bear the cost, is that the, the government isn't as, you know, I don't see it as a sort of agent that's just there uh, taking on the cost itself. The, the, the government can take over debts. And then the question is, well, where are we really going to finance the, uh, um, you know, the, the servicing costs of all this debt that the state has taken on. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there because I don't want to. Okay, thank you very much. I, I, before I give the, the word to, to Katarina in my privilege as chair, I have to say that the, the literature on moral hazard in banking and finance is one that is very rich because sometimes one thinks of moral hazard as only one set of incentives, but it's a set of incentives for everyone. So it's distorted set of incentives for creditors, distorted set of incentives for debtors, distorted set of incentives for government. So there is only not just one, one, one way of, 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 of having moral hazard or one group of people that have moral hazard. Moral hazard, which is the belief that the government is going to assist you and that somehow you can believe, behave more irresponsibly because the government will assist you. That's the traditional understanding in, in banking and finance. What sometimes is perhaps not so much thought about is that the, the, the distorted incentives is not only for debtors, it's also for creditors and it's also for governments. So one has always to be very careful in any blanket guarantee. After all, the government is us all and it will end up being, you know, unless we, we inflate uh, the debt away, it will end up being a massive, you know, deficit in years to come. So obviously we need to also be careful from an economic and legal perspective. But, you know, thank you very much for, for your reflections on that. And Katarina, I put the same question to you, this balance between debt relief and moral hazard, what's, what's the correct balance in your opinion, as well as anything else that you want to say, either in response or comment to the presentations that have been made so far. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I think in some ways in a crisis like ours, it's not the right time to think about moral hazard. Um, this is a pandemic. This is an exogenous shock to the system and we have to think about how to get out of this, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't think about who might benefit in particular from, from measures and might sort of again be bailed out. And um, so I think we have a moral hazard actually on the side of creditors, on the side of the financial intermediaries who have experienced um, repeat bailouts by the government. So I think that is a, a real problem. We probably should not reinforce it. But I think we have to realize that given the scale of the crisis, which Franklin has alluded to, um, that we probably are all better off if we you know, um, get together and try to restructure debt on a massive scale, even if there are some who benefit from it and have basically played the game to benefit from the next bailout, even if we have moral hazard. I think the, the scale of the problem is just too large to just get uh, sidetracked on that. If we get stuck, or stuck with that debate, I don't think we can make any progress. Just a couple of points on, on what our other speakers have said. Um, um, I agree with, with Franklin that the corporate sector, we have to think about as well, small and medium-sized enterprises. There are two things. It's one, um, I think, um, their, their, their debt structure. I think corporations in the US in particular have 
been gorged on debt over the last decade. Um, that again has been fueled, I think, by a supply side, by the financial sector, who has basically moved the structured finance system from, um, from mortgage-backed securities to the balance sheets of the corporations. Um, and, and of course, to, and that has benefited shareholders in the, in the form of share repurchases in a, in a big way. Um, uh, so in, in a sense, you know, there's a moral hazard issue here as well. Um, but I think many of these firms will need to uh, restructure their, their, just their capital, their corporate um, finance structure fundamentally to be sustainable in the longer term, as I suggested before. On, on Rodrigo and sort of the role of law and legal institutions, you know, I think we typically do relax the binding force of law in crisis or sometimes suspend the rules of the game. And uh, we have no choice. The question is, of course, always um, for whose benefit are we doing that? And when, when can we go back to a system where we can make some kind of credible commitments to one another that are backed by law and people still trust that they're actually somehow somehow um, cre um, credible? Because if we suspend and relax um, uh, too radically, of course, first of all, we need rules of the game. Otherwise, we can't organize ourselves. And the second is that we need to come back to some kind of uh, new way of dealing with one another. So I think the emphasis should be then on how to uh, structure the new rules of the game and how to think about not only as a, in a temporary measure, but really um, uses as a, as a new beginning. The last thing I want to say is, you know, when you think about, you know, what the role of the government is, if we only think about uh, debt as the solution, then we will never get out of this. Um, I think that we're just running into circles. I think we cannot rule out you know, equity, which is in the terms of the government intervening is, 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 is nationalization or call it something else, call it like with the Fannie Mae and, and, and Freddie Mac in the 2008 crisis, they're still in government um, administration, right? They were supposed to be taken down and they have, um, they're still there basically on the lifeline of the government. Um, they have made money in between uh, and now are paying money into the government but basically it was a kind of a nationalization by, by other means and these are um, um, measures available as well we don't only have to indebt ourselves we can take equity okay, thank you very much Katarina you actually took my next question away but that question will be coming to the others too which is I will put the question in case you know Franklin and, and, and Rodrigo also want to talk about that. And then obviously I will give the opportunity to Alex to also talk about that. But, you know, it is clear to me, I mean, obviously to other people, not just to me, that what the economy needs is not new loans, is not more debt, but equity. We need to figure out some form in which we can transform existing debt into equity. And, you know, it can be done, you know, in the previous crisis, in the, the global financial crisis, which was not as, as, as global as this one, and it did not affect every sector as this one. I mean, here from education, I mean, hugely disrupted from primary school to, to university, unheard of in a generation, only previous experience in wartime. So the, this, is, this crisis, I put it at the bigger stage because it affects everyone. You know, we all, if we have children, you know, they're running in the different rooms, you know, trying to get their Zoom conferences to attend the class. But, you know, coming back to the, this debt to equity conversion, the, the, one of the interesting developments in, in response to the global financial crisis was this bail-in resolution tool, which actually transformed debt into equity. So there are, there, are, there are have been throughout history a lot of debt equity swaps and techniques and restructuring techniques. And, and I do agree very much with you, Katarina, that, that the solution, and, and there was a question also from Angus in this regard, that uh, we need to, to not be so reliant on debt and we need to, to build deep venture finance markets and we need to move into equity investment. So, uh, uh, since now we have two questions, instead of one, this accumulates like, like a, a snowball that goes from the mountains. Uh, frankly, now when you, when you answer, it's not only the, the debt relief versus moral hazard type of balancing act, but also moving into this fascinating issue of how can we create more equity investment? How can we do debt to equity conversion in the current crisis? And of course, one of the questions is uh, kind of building between the two. Some are corona debt related and some is previous debt. So sometimes you come back, back, bank on the existing debt and trying to say that you know, everything is fine just because it's corona related when in fact it predates 
uh, the coronavirus. That's where something else with a moral hazard sets in that you, on the basis of an existing program, you want to roll over existing debt. So, uh, frankly, uh, if you want to talk about these basically two issues, moving into equity investment and the balance between debt relief and moral hazard, the floor is yours. So there, are, there are so many things to talk about. Let me see if I can, can limit. Let, let me just start with some of the things that Alex was saying. So, and, and Katerina had said before, which is this notion that the, that, that uh, poor people are getting into debt, and that's a big part of the of the of the issue. And I, I think in, in terms of social welfare, it's a big part of the issue. There are a lot of poor people who are suffering uh, under under heavy debt loads, but. It's limited in the sense that if you're poor, it's difficult to borrow. So you don't get access to debt. You, you may have credit card debt at these phenomenal rates. You may have student debt, which also have very high rates relative to, to other, other kinds of instruments. So, so those are problematic. But if you look at what, what is most of the private sector debt, you know, a large part is mortgages. So mortgages are collateralized. So you know, there's an issue. Do we need to forgive those? Well, you know, we can extend them and we can do, do those, those kinds of things. Um, if asset prices have fallen, that's a big part of the issue here. And is that going to happen? That, that, that relates to how bad is this going to be? Then, you know, the collateral values don't cover the debt. So then you get into a big problem because um, the question is what you do then. And, and again, the, the questions you start to get into it is who takes the hit and I, and I think that that's still the big question and you're right about the the government um and, and they're representing us but there are lots of issues that we haven't talked about in terms of international capital mobility for example a lot of the capital that we have in the uk has been lent to us from people overseas we've run very large deficits current account deficits and finance them on the capital deficit now you can introduce capital controls and all those kinds of things, but we, we you know, that ha what's happened after the war, basically capital controls came in, you couldn't take, move money around globally. Do we want to go in that direction? I, I'm not sure we do. I don't think that was a good, a, a good thing to do um, in the long run, maybe, maybe in the short run. Um, you know, ultimately, it's probably a good thing if, if rich people take the hit. But the problem is that rich people are very good at getting, a, getting out of taking the hit. So that they'll take their money abroad and then take it out. So, so there are a lot of issues of, of those kinds which are important. Uh, I think there is a lot of moral hazard, particularly because we do keep getting um, repeated bailouts, as, as Katerina was saying. I think, you know, this issue of debt versus equity is a very interesting one. And one of the questions at the moment is, you know, it's true that, that uh, equity seems to be state contingent contract. But if you look at what the central banks have done, you know, there's the, what we used to call the, the, the Greenspan put. But now we could append that, you know, the, the, the adjective to all, all the central bank governors that as soon as things get into trouble, they, they lower interest rates, and now we have negative interest rates in many countries and all those kinds of things. And so it's not so clear equity is such, such a great instrument, actually, in the aggregate. I mean, I think, you know, venture capital has lots of good things about it. But again, if you think about where equity levels are at the moment, and it's not so clear that that's the actual value of these things, that it's just being people print money. And at the moment, we're getting not consumer price inflation, which is sort of the traditional argument, we're getting asset price inflation. And that's extremely risky because, you know, if, if asset price is half, and I would say that, would, you know, that's happened in the, in the 70s, it's happened um, in many periods, that's going to play havoc with defined contribution pensions. Uh, you know, that, then the people are going to be taking the hit, a, a pensioners to a large extent. So, uh, there, there are a lot of issues of moral hazard, not just with debt, but I also think with equity. And, and so the, the, these are complex questions. And, and as Rosa was saying earlier, I think there are a lot of very interesting kinds of solutions that we need to come up with. One of the interesting ones in, in the 30s was uh, a very controversial legal decision, 
which is the, the abrogation, well, it, depends how you view it. <laughs> it depends how you view the Supreme Court decision about the gold clauses in, in, uh, in debt. And, uh, you know, they basically said, well, they're no longer valid. It's like the, the case of the Japanese with the insurance companies. Many, many people, many macroeconomists think that was a great thing because it, that reduced the debt overhang. Many legal scholars think that was terrible because they abrogated the contract. So, but, but I think that that's a very interesting issue. Um, so th there are problems with, with all of these kinds of solutions. I think we do have to be clever. They, there are a lot of things that we, we don't understand well. And you know, the ultimate, or one of the ultimate problems is that if, if we do get money leaking out into the consumer price space, then we have inflation. And we know that from the 70s and before in South America and so on, that that kind of inflation is also extremely damaging and destroys a lot of trust in the economic system and, and, and huge problems there. Now, at the moment, that isn't happening because, you know, despite the fact that central banks are printing huge quantities of money and it's going to buy assets, they're directly financing governments, companies now, many, many aspects. But most of that money is staying in the financial system because people are pretty scared about what's going to happen and it's getting saved. And so there are a whole set of issues there that I, th that I think are important. So th this equity versus debt is much more complicated, I would say, than, than the micro kinds of issues that the banking and finance literature is focused on. So, you know, the promise is if you've got debt, then you, you, you know, you've got incentive to go out and take a risk. That, that's certainly there. That's a big problem that has been in many financial crises. But you've got lots of other kinds of moral hazards going on. I think we, we need to be, to be uh, cognizant of those. So the other thing to remember about, bank, about uh, debt forgiveness is we have that, it's called, the, the other way to do it is default. And the default is, you know, enforced debt forgiveness. It just tends to be a lot more costly. So I think we have to, to be very judicious about quite how we split up, who we allow to give, who, who gets debt forgiveness versus who we force into default. And the incentive issues, that's again an, a, a large incentive issue in terms of um, why we have bankruptcy and why in some countries, uh, it's much easier than in other countries. And that's still true today. And, you know, we, we used to make it very difficult to get debt, uh, to default on debt. So we had debt as prison and all those kinds of things. M most countries, or pretty much all countries, I believe, have got rid of those because uh, default is a good thing because it, it allows risk taking and so on. So the, the issues here, we, you know, as, as Rose said, there's a huge literature on them. We, we can we can uh, you know, talk about a lot of those kinds of issues. But I, I think that the pandemic does, does create other issues. Um, let, me, let me make one more point. The question is, how, how exogenous is this? I mean, certainly no one expected it. If you look back though, the WHO has been warning about this for a long time. It's, it's usually on the top 10 lists. It's not unknown. If you think back to the uh, Spanish flu, that's 100 years ago, it's not that far. And you can see all the pictures of, of what people did in, in those days and so on. But there are many other similar events. So the global financial crisis was a big event. It was unexpected. I don't think anybody, well, very few people expected it. And there are many other events. I mean, we haven't had a, a very serious war for a long time. If we had something like the Second World War or, you know, war, some kind of hostilities in, in uh, the Pacific or, you know, the, the obvious one at the moment would be between China and the US, say maybe over to Taiwan. These would have similar kinds of effects in terms of causing huge disruption to the economic system. And so I think it's true that each one of them is kind of unique and exogenous, but people need to start thinking, what, what do I do if we get into a world where suddenly I lose my job or the you know, asset values halve and those things? We need to have a lot more people worrying about having savings and having, having buffers to get them through it, as well as corporations and banks and governments worrying about buffers. Let me stop there.
Thank you very much. And now, uh, Rodrigo, you can discuss anything that you want. On Rosa, I'm going to be very brief, uh, and I'm going to touch very briefly on the two points that, that you are raising, uh, the one on moral hazard and the one on uh, debt versus equity. And I probably will briefly refer to, to Franklin's reference to the gold clauses. But um, on, on the moral hazard issue, you know, Rosa, that that's a, a topic which is kind of uh, the one I, I relate probably more, uh, and the clear example is uh, that some countries end up becoming serial defaulters, uh, and one of them is Argentina, which is about to face its ninth default. So basically, uh, when Alexander was talking about reform, basically, Argentina has entered into a technical default uh, and has until the 22nd of May to cure that. If not, it would be its ninth default in history. And a few years ago, they were issuing, uh, in 2017, they issued a 100-year bond. So basically, uh, that, that, that's the problem that I see and that's the problem that moral hazard creates. The other issue is that uh, there are some countries that cannot repay their debts and basically they don't have the proper control or domestic mechanisms to deal with undesired debts. And then we think that probably uh, forgiving debts is the way forward. Well, rather the, the actual solution should be trying to find the right mechanisms uh, to cope with these issues domestically. And I'm referring mainly to some of the recent scandals about hidden debts in, in Africa, uh, where basically there are plenty of examples to draw from, and, and some, some of the people that I've seen that are present in, in, at the moment uh, are following those, uh, follow in this webinar are following those cases closely, but basically the most obvious one is uh, that of uh, Mozambique. And then uh, going to the debt versus equity debate, uh, this has already been, and I basically think that probably uh, in the banking sector, uh, and Rosa, you referred to that with the, the bailing tools, the COCOs, et cetera, that, that's where this, this is most advanced. In the sovereign debt uh, sector and sovereign debt arena, there, there have been in the past instruments that have been used in this regard. We have the GDP link warrants. Uh, the only problem with those instruments that we have is that uh, the structuring of those type of instruments is very difficult. It's very difficult because they produce the the benchmark that you have to use. It's very difficult to to keep it. Uh, uh, in a way that cannot be easily manipulated. And again, the, the case of Argentina is a good example because they were manipulating their own statistics in order not to trigger repayment. Uh, there, there are others that have been used in the past which are linked to oil prices, the value recovery rights that have been used by, for example, Venezuela, Nigeria, uh, Mexico, which basically it, they produce additional payments if basically, you accept a uh, a debt uh, forgiveness through a debt restructuring exercise where you are uh, given, among other things, a value recovery right, which is linked to the price of commodities. And more recently, the Bank of England and the Bank of Canada, they were championing an initiative about GDP-linked bonds, not warrants, but actually bonds. Uh, the problem that they have been experiencing is uh, getting a first mover, basically the, the same issue. One is linked, similar to GDP link warrants, is how to structure it correctly to prevent any kind of manipulation. But uh, if you manage to overcome that difficulty, then the other one that you have is that sometimes some of these instruments are so complex that they're not that appealing to investors. But I think that those two can, can be overcome. The most difficult one is finding a first mover. Uh, because you don't have a, since there's no market, it's very difficult to get this off the ground. 
and quickly on the reference to the gold clauses in the US in the 1930s. Uh, in that instance, the, uh, and, and I had a, the luck to be, this, to be able to discuss this with, with Sebastian Edwards in, uh, not long ago in February. And basically, uh, what happened there was that the US Supreme Court considered that the decision to unilaterally convert the contracts was unconstitutional but the parties did not suffer any damages due, due to the deflation. And basically what this produced was that the, the real value of the debt owed to the bondholders actually had increased. So, but um, on the issue, basically just to wrap up, the issue of moral hazard is one that basically when you see what has happened in the past and several experiences with the less developed countries, then that's what, what worries me the most about the possible unintended consequences. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, for bringing the discussion a little bit away from there are obviously different levels of debt. And so far we've been talking about, or this seminar is mostly about a private sector debt relief in the UK as part of the government exit strategy. But there is a whole dimension which is fundamental, which is the, the issue of sovereign debt. The G20 during the April meetings of the IMF approved a temporary standstill which according to many people is, is not enough because it's, 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 it's not sufficiently long enough and also it doesn't encompass private sector debt relief. So the issue also of private sector debt relief also comes at the sovereign debt level. But uh, let me allow now for the purposes of the discussion to reconduct the, the questions to the situation here in the UK. I mean, obviously everyone can talk about the experience in other countries. But one of the things that I'd like in the next round of questions, looking at some of the questions that I have received and also some of the conversation I had with Angus and the Institute before the session, is a little bit the medium term consequences in terms of inequality, investment and productivity. Those medium term consequences were already problematic in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And indeed the rise in populism is in no small amount related to the discontent that there was with the established situation. So I think, uh, as Katerina was saying, and on that I agree, this is actually not the right time to talk about moral hazard. This is the time to find a solution. It's like when you have a fire, you first put the fire, and then you rewrite the fire regulations to ensure that they don't lead to moral hazard. But we, 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 we you know, as part of the, of the discussion now, let me move to the, the, to the medium term consequences that each of you see in terms of inequality, investment and productivity. Of course, at any point you can go back to any of the issues like greater reliance on equity instead of debt or venture capital or anything else. And also mix it with something else. And that is going back to imaginative solutions as Franklin was saying and we we're just discussing a couple. And it was mentioned again in the, in the New Deal, there was this agency that was set up. I mean, we still have the Penny, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, but there was the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was a useful agency in the eyes of many. And there is a, um, a couple of scholars in the US, uh, friends of many of us, Saúl Omarova and Bob Thompson, which have talked about the National Investment Authority at this point in time, looking at the example of the World War II, but also looking at the RFC that was um, a result of the New Deal legislation. So just, just moving forward, the discussion a little bit from the immediate catastrophe that we are experiencing and will continue to experience. Uh, the, the, the obviously, uh, to put the struggling business into formal insolvency, that seemed to me very highly value destructive. So we need to look to changes in insolvency law. We need to look at other things. So it's a collection of questions. You don't need to answer to all of them, but uh, just, just to move that, and I, I will start again with you, Alex. You can obviously go back to the equity issue before, but this kind of, of medium-term solutions, which also tackle some of the philosophical issues that you were referring to. So I'll Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I, I think um, absolutely the uh, a shift towards public investment as a medium-term solution seems like... Uh, the ne a necessary step in, in resolving the inequality issue. So I should say, by the way, I guess when I started off talking about debt forgiveness, as, as Franklin pointed out, you know, the, the kinds of distressed debts of, of households, I don't think are making up a lot of the, a big percentage of, of the private debt um, 
overhang. It's just, it, so that's really a distributional issue. You know, the question is, well, should we, should we do something redistributive to uh, uh, help people in that situation rather, rather than, you know, that being something that you do as a macro, part of a macro policy. Um, but I guess now we seem to be talking about these, these macroeconomic issues. Um, I guess also this, I thought it was interesting, this point also from Franklin that um, if you're thinking about a debt to equity conversion, equity doesn't really behave like equity depending on what policy does because we've sort of set up a situation where so much of our public provision, um, like p pensions especially, is based on you know maintaining certain values for both equity and and various sorts of assets. You, know, you have these pension funds that are just hoovering up uh, shares right through tracker funds and things. So you can't really let them collapse unless you're willing to let your pensioners uh, fall into poverty, which seems like a, a big call. Um, I will get back to the public investment question, but just another thing about this inflationary risk as well, right? So you have central banks creating all of these reserves and then you have those at the moment they're just uh being drained away into these various assets and various savings instruments and so you might think that well there's all this spending power that's right now just locked up in these assets at some point that'll explode and leak out um i mean it seems like that isn't that sounds like an inevitability to me. I don't know if it's a medium thing or a long-term thing. So, th so then the question is, well, well, what happens at that stage? You can't control uh, an inflationary shock like that by um, having central banks raise interest rates when that's going to explode this already enormous public debt. So I guess you would be looking at some kind of fiscal uh, contraction at that point, I feel, I don't know, I mean, I'm not a macroeconomist, but it seems like the only way that you, you could even try to tame uh, something like that would, would be to, you know, fiscally contract on, on, on both sides. I mean, cranking up the tax revenues as well as reducing spending. So, um, you know, then I guess there'll be all these questions about distributive justice because the question will be, well, who can you tax and how and how hard? Um, and at the same time, I guess you'll want to have lots of public investments in place as a potential source of revenue for the public sector down the road. I mean, it, it seems to me that we do this th through the central bank uh collateral frameworks it seems like you have the state directing investment anyway in a way right if, if you're a bank you know that uh mortgages mortgage-backed securities are on the bank of england's eligible collateral list uh, on the sterling framework so you're not going to have any problem even you know in in times of great risk and uncertainty you're not really going to have a problem lending uh into the housing sector, which means you're pushing up house prices and asset prices and things like that. Whereas to building contractors who want to build more houses or anybody, you know, doing any kind of infrastructure investment is a different story, not collateralized in the same way. So really, in a way, if you had a public investment uh, scheme, a public investment bank, a green development bank, all of these things, you'd really only be evening, leveling the playing field, it seems like, between different classes of investment through the financial system um and also it means that at some point these big assets that you've created mortgage-backed securities and things when they leak out if that happens and start driving inflation then you know at least you'll have some of the uh, options in place and kind of sources of revenue sources of investment but um i'm not sure if that was a question you were asking but anyway those were some of my thoughts interesting reflections in any way and uh, Franklin, you want to add something else? You're muted still. Franklin. I'm happy to make some, some comments on, on public investment. So, um, you know, we, that's what happened after World War II, basically, that people decided that the private sector did allocate resources and do things properly. So in many countries, they nationalized the banks, they nationalized the whole financial system, they allocated credit. In other countries, they nationalized huge swathes of the economy. And then what we went through was the 60s and, and 70s, and it didn't seem to work very well. So then we 
uh, we went the opposite way. So I think I think there is there is a place for public investment, but by and large, it doesn't do a very good job for innovation, and that's the problem. That you know, ultimately, particularly in today's world, what in the medium and long term, what matters is innovation, and uh, you know, I think that venture capital does a pretty good job relative to other mechanisms, and that's one of its its great strengths. But governments have a terrible record in terms of choosing what what to um, invest in, except after wars with huge amounts of physical damage. And France did very well in the 1950s, and that was because a lot of things had been destroyed, and so it was fairly clear what you needed to do. But as soon as you get into a, a technological society, they're not very good at, at doing that, it seems. You know, the classic example is Concord. They, 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 th they made a decision that what they was gonna happen was that it was gonna be supersonic travel. Boeing decided they're not going to do that because it wasn't commercially viable and they were right and the governments were wrong And there are many other examples of that kind of thing that public and public investment Just ends up in many cases Wasting large amounts of mon money and of course that was the problem in many of the communist countries too They simply wasted huge amounts of investment that was essentially became worthless hey, Okay, here. Katarina, you were raising your hand and also it's your turn. So if I will um, let me just lower my hand. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would say, you know, we have effectively socialized financial markets. That's what the central banks have done. We've had an investment famine for the last 15 to 20 years. So we've seen how you can ratchet up private wealth and private savings by creating the system that we have, which relies ex extensively on debt finance, on structured uh, finance, on the shadow banking system, and has enormously created wealth for the top 1% or the top 0.1%. Um, um, a, a large debt, um, it, a large part of the debt is actually um, carried by lo relatively lower income households. I think Atif Mian has a great uh, paper about that. So, but I think what, what the main point I want to say, when we think about what governments have done, what private markets have done over the last 15 or 20 years, it's not the private sector that has excelled as, at all this great stuff. Yes, big tech has become big, but mostly because they have exploited monopolist uh, powers to become as scalable as they did. And I'm not sure that we all necessarily benefit from that. So I think we have to, uh, you know, I'm not saying that the Soviet Union didn't, didn't happen. I'm not, not saying, you know, going back to that, I don't think that's very productive. But what we should actually concede is that the system that we had prior to the crisis was no longer delivering what we think it was delivering, which is sort of this private innovative competitive markets. It wasn't very competitive. It didn't develop, um, deliver on the investment front. So I think we just don't even, you know, once we have already socialized financial markets, it doesn't, um, uh, you know, it doesn't take such a great step to think about how do we marshal our resources to do actual investment, actual investments that create jobs, that deliver econ economic goods for for um, for the majority of the people. And I think I, I do like the idea of thinking about sort of a, a sort of an investment agency that could be some combination of private and public funding. I'm a little worried about many of the legal structures I have seen for public-private partnerships, which typically put the risk on the public and the and the profits on the private. So that has to be divided up in a different kind of way, but it's not impossible to combine that. I think there has been a lot of innovation um, um, about how to combine um, you know, public and private resources. China has done remarkably well. I don't want to be you know, advocating that system. It has many flaws as well, but I just want to go, get over the debate is that the, the public always makes bad um, decisions. Final point I'm going to say also in terms of invention, when you think about where all the fundamental um, inventions, innovation come from for our drugs or um, uh, pharmaceuticals, it comes from public sector like the NIH in the United States and other um, institutions that are publicly funded elsewhere because the private sector gets into the game only when they can make profits and a lot of fundamental research doesn't produce profits into, in, immediately. So I think we do have to have a huge um, demand for fundamental um, in, in investment in, in, uh, in both research and investment which the private sector hasn't delivered for a while. Thank you very much, Katerina. Before I pass to uh, Rodrigo, there was a question that was saying that governments have terrible record with regard to innovation. However, some someone said contradicting that there is entrepreneurial states. I I, um, um, I would also like to recall that one of the the things that we're experiencing today, the amazing thing with the 
internet revolution really was due to public spending of the US on defense and strategy and it, it all started in Pentagon. And, and so the, 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 all the systems that allows these days us to drive through the roads and for me, I'm a useless driver. I always now rely on, the, on, on these systems that navigate me and uh, all, all, all was due actually to, to huge public investment, perhaps for another reason, but uh, it should not be underestimated. I, I would like uh, now, before I, I pass the word to, to you, Rodrigo, to, to go back a little bit to, to the, 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 the title of the, of the seminar today. Should private sector debt relief be part of the exit strategy? And particularly, I would like you to comment on three things. One, you very helpfully discussed the various types of debt and the different treatment and rules that apply to household debt, corporate debt, bank debt, and sovereign debt. And uh, just let's take two of them. Let's leave aside banking and finance and just let's focus on SMEs, corporate, well, SMEs as large companies, but mostly SMEs, which are really struggling with the pandemic. Those, those are the ones that are mostly struggling to pay rents, to pay workers. What happens when the furlough schemes goes? What happens when people can return social distancing rules? All the things that we read in the news all the time. So let's, let's focus on household and a, well, you can talk about the other things that we talked about before, but household and, and companies. And um, are you in favor of mortgage holidays in, with regard to household debt repayments? Do you think that some solution along those lines could facilitate? And why would you propose that it is the best uh, private sector debt relief for SMEs? And you know what changes in the insolvency legislation could be introduced in the UK that could because there is there are going to be changes in the legislation as you know that could facilitate looking particularly at corporate and I would say SMEs and household. You can talk about anything else, but I know you've been following these issues. So if you want to Sorry, Rosa, I missed the last bit. You went silent on the last bit of you, but I, I think that basically you want me to tell, uh, focus on SMEs uh, and what should be the way forward. As SMEs and household in the UK. Okay. Uh, Rosa, for, for me... Sorry, and also changes in the insolvency legislation in this country in that regard. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, Rosa, for, for me, I, I, I thought that was very clear in my presentation, but basically for me, uh, we are living uh, extraordinary times uh, and not for, the, for extraordinary good reasons. And basically, in such circumstances, we need extraordinary measures. Uh, I am definitely, definitely in favor of a temporary standstill. Uh, six, nine, twelve months, even roll it, roll it over for even longer. Uh, I am not in favor of an outright debt forgiveness. Uh, I am definitely in favor on interest holidays. Uh, and uh, to going to the point that you were taking, telling me about uh, how do you see uh, law insolvency reform, etc. I think that basically what we need is an extraordinary act addressing uh, mainly two or three things. One is a, a blanket interest holiday uh, link with a simplified procedure, less cumbersome and more accessible for household lands and SMEs. Um, and on the back of that, a, a, a streamlined a process for a, non SMEs corporation why because there will be a, there's there will be a backlog and there will be a, an overburden of the whole judicial system uh, in addition to that uh, and more generally i think that basically uh, what we are doing at the moment is we are i think we are putting the cart before the horse because we are talking about a uh, debt forgiveness and basically we, first we need to to get the economy going basically uh, unless we manage to get the economy going basically uh, all of the things will be will be secondary but basically we don't basically we need to do some kind of uh, debt sustainability analysis to be able to and basically uh, with no cash flow then basically it, it's a binary equation basically total debt total income basically we need to 
to write off everything. Uh, and, and that is something that basically uh, it cannot work on that assumption. Because basically uh, what we will, <laughs> what that will imply is basically uh, bankrupting the whole system and basically uh, collapsing everything. So that's why basically, I think that basically a blanket moratorium and basically while we manage to get things going uh, and in parallel, that blanket moratorium will allow for, for simplified procedures to start taking place because, because if we don't do a proper analysis, uh, well, I, I've been listening, talking about debt forgiveness of whom, of how much. So these are uncertainties that if we don't have certain facts, uh, we cannot basically just plug a number from thin air and say, okay, 20%, 30% or whatever. So I will start with a blanket moratorium and, and that is something that, that will benefit everyone alike and uh, will be on equal grounding uh, all the parties. And basically, uh, this, has, this is something that has already been put in place uh, and or in the past or, or in other jurisdictions. Uh, uh, Catalina, I could see that you wanted to say something, so I, I will let you talk. No, I was just thinking that I'm afraid that we are in a situation where we probably need some, you know, we, are, we are basically insolvent, right? They're just, I mean, if, if Franklin's estimate or assessment of the situation is correct, and this will last for longer, I agree that we need more numbers, but I think we should basically recognize the fact that we have reached a point where we are dealing with massive insolvency. I would also just add to that, if we just think about rebuilding the system first, what do you rebuild it with when you have a, this massive drop of in demand and, and insolvency? How do you rebuild it? I think you can rebuild it only that's part of the story of by getting rid um, of the debt. I would also say that we need to be very mindful about the measures that we're taking now. If we just rebuild the system that we have, and I was trying to say at the beginning of my remarks that the system that we had didn't really deliver for most of the people what they needed. So just rebuilding the system and trying to prop it up again and then find solution won't work because once you rebuild something, everybody who has a massive entrenched interest in the system that we had will prevent any meaningful reforms. We've seen this in 2008, 2009, and I think this crisis is too big to try this, that again. Thank you. Uh, before I go on, Angus, um, when we have been talking about this seminar, I know that you have some strong views. Can I? Can you just say a few thoughts on, on, on some of the things that you have heard so far? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, well, it's been a, a fascinating discussion. I think that um, uh, the way that the discussion was framed as this crisis happening for several years and what that really means, it's, it's all too easy to look from here rather than taking yourself sort of two or three years forward and say, okay, it's going to be this bad, now what do you want to do? Um, that I think is a very different discussion. I uh, have an issue about, um, you know, debt forgiveness, everybody would like to do it, but the issue is well, what about financial stability? And then you come into the, well, then you're going to have to change the system. Okay, well, that's part of a big discussion. And I suppose my um, lingering question is who does that? How does that get brought about? Um, is it a central bank that discusses the whole financial structure? And I don't just mean banks. I mean, you know, insurance companies, mortgage agencies, whatever, all of those institutions. Is it their discussion? Because it's not an area they like to go into. It's extremely political. It's all about distribution. Is it the government? Is it a finance ministry? Again, that's a, that's a huge call and uh, requires extreme, you know, extraordinary expertise. Although it is... Um, always worth remembering what was achieved um, uh, uh, in the um, New Deal and the remarkable uh, um, reforms that were carried out then, where you know, without you know anything like a, even a computer, obviously. Um, so it is possible, but first of all, it's a political question: of who would do this? Who, which agencies would put this down on paper? It's got to be political. It's got to be driven by a finance ministry. I think it can't be a a technocratic institution like a central bank. Um, and then where would we start? How would we start framing this? Um, almost all of our models, and I suppose this gets us to rebuilding macroeconomics, 
are based on the idea of optimization and uh, and so on. And that's not quite what we're dealing with here. Uh, it is not an issue of how do you just let this take away what are perceived as market failures and let competition lead to the best outcome. That's not what I think that requires when you start saying, actually, you've got a multi-year problem with quite a lot of debt and central banks doing things that they weren't really designed to do, you know, in Franklin's terms of, of intervening so heavily in equity markets. Um, uh, uh, what sort of economic framework would you need to make these decisions, which basically depends on distributive justice? Um, that gets us to uh, quite a different place to most of the debates on um, which are much shorter term in nature. But then, of course, these are, you know, in Whitehall, they've, they've got their work cut out on a very short term basis. But um, if this does last longer, these questions certainly come onto the table. Um, so I think they're very legitimate. And I'd be very interested to find out uh, the, the, uh, uh, Katharina's sort of suggestion of we need to have a consideration or discussion of about the longer term reforms of how you build these sort of um, markets. So whose job is that uh, and on what basis? So that's the question I, I, I would like to hear. So Katarina, you've been asked the question, so no. <laughs> Without further ado. <laughs> that's an easy question, right? So yes, it's political. I don't think the central banks ought to do this. I don't think the central banks can do this. The central banks can provide a lot of liquidity. They can't do investment, right? So they're basically reinforcing the system that we have, but they're and, and helping to stabilize it. And I think it's important. It gives us some breathing space, but we sort of need, that, need to use this breathing space to move forward. So it has to be a political institution, has to come, um, will be governed by finance ministry. Of course, the justice ministry was, will be in, you know, um, you could think about new ministries that might have to be created to do the kind of investment job that, that, that we need. So we need uh, new types of institutions. The, the real issue that we're facing is sort of the political backing that we need and that somehow FDR was um, able to, to fathom behind, behind him. I'm not sure that the current uh, politicians, certainly on this side of the Atlantic, are capable of doing that. Um, uh, but, but that's in an ideal world who thinks of forward, we, we're hoping for uh, politicians that will uh, rise to the occasion. Then the how, you know, I think the, you know, in, in terms of the, the needs are greatest on the, on the periphery of people who are poor, who are miserable, who are really, you know, they will lose their jobs, they will lose their houses, they will be on the street unless we do something. Clearly, we have to have a debt moratorium, if not a full debt forgiveness for them. And then you have to think about the next level of intermediaries, which will fold because of that. And so I think for that, we just probably have to step in and nationalize. So when I was talking about equity before, I was also not only referring to private equity, but public equity. So there is, you know, there's, there's like, you know, you, you take out these financial intermediaries. We've done this before in, in multiple crises where, um, you know, you typically then try to hand them on to another private entity, but you can think about a public bank to, 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 um, uh, to do this in, in this type of context. And then in the longer term, you may want to reprivatize. I, I don't want to have a completely publicly owned and run system, but I think in, 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 in the context that we're in, we have to think very seriously about who else might take these kind of measures so i would build it up from the from the bottom to make sure that we take care of the people who are really really in need and you know maybe prop up the the, the top of the system through banking uh, central bank liquidity in the mean term but then develop plans how to reorganize the system on a, on a larger scale along the way okay that is very helpful and actually the next question links to that and has been put by some of the people that have been participated in the chat some of them have been talking about uh, looking at issues on the reconstruction in the medium term, the surrounding equitable growth versus green growth versus plain economic growth. So again, looking at the short term versus the long term. And you know, obviously, when one is in short term crisis management, and we can all agree that at the moment we are in that, we are in the midst of short term crisis management, fighting with whatever instruments we have, furlough schemes, central bank liquidity, guarantees of loans, and all sorts of measures in the UK, US, EU, around the world, every country doing everything that they can. And sometimes the danger, of course, with the short term crisis management is to lose time of the long term perspective. Franklin before was saying that, you know, these are 100 year events, the pandemics, the previous one was the 
ill name because it was not really Spanish. Originally, I come from Spain. It was not really the Spanish flu, but so it got the name, the Spanish flu. But obviously, just before before this pandemic, everyone was talking about climate change and and the the effects that it it, it has. And that is that's a longer term issue related to this green growth, related also to some of the issues that you mentioned in your book, Katarina, and that others have discussed. Also, you, Alex, have talked about that. And I think you know that this issue of, of the short term versus the long term is something which I would like all of you to reflect, because indeed some of the things that we're talking about in terms of the right political decisions they concern how how do we build from here not only how we fight the crisis, which we need to continue to do. And so I will put that question together with another, so to give you a variety of questions to see what you, each of you prefer to answer. The other question has been also something that several of the chat and, and a couple of you in your comments have been talking about, and that is the, the limits of the, of the liquidity provided by central banks. Central banks were the, the, the only game in town in the, in the global financial crisis by providing a, a very fundamental amount of liquidity to the system. And central banks, again, a, or not the only game in town, because this time, you know, you need the governments to put, you know, the, the fiscal and capital support. But, you know, across the world, certainly in the, in the case of the EU, in the case of the Bank of England, with the extension of the infamous or famous way and means facility, the issue and the dangers of monetary financing in the US, you know, we come in you know, with all sorts of facilities, rescuing not only banks, but capital markets. All these things are very much putting into question the limits of what central banks can do, an issue which was already before COVID, just in response of how much we had extended the power of, of monetary policy and liquidity assistance and central banking. So if you also want to, to comment either on the short term versus long term, which includes the green growth, equitable growth versus plain economic growth, or this, this, uh, this thing that sometimes in, in central banking circles sometimes say that we all have, sometimes we lose ability in the, in the private financial sector, but we keep our faith on the central banks. But what happens if we were to lose faith in the ability of the central banks to rescue the economy? And so with these two questions, I start with you, Alex. Take either of the two or the two of them, and then we just go another round. Thanks. So, I mean, I, I'll just revert to making philosophical points. Uh, I, I, in my... In my original presentation, I held myself... That, that's what you're supposed to talk about, you know. So please reconduct the discussion and the questions to your philosophical and your opinion. Great. Okay. Thank you. I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I help myself to these phrases like social good and public purpose and things. And of course, you know, I mean, what, what are those things? I, I feel like politically we don't have conversations about those things um, really the way that even I think... It, when I was younger, I can remember political conversations being about somebody would say, this is my vision for the economy. You know, this is where we want to get to. And, you know, if people vote for that, then it's okay. Well, now, like, what instruments do we use to, to get to this vision? I, I, you know, without having that in mind, I don't think we can answer any of these other questions, really. Nor do I think we can avoid the question by... Um, saying, for example, we want to just leave the market to, to kind of decide what direction it's going to take the economy, because, I mean, I think Katarina's book is fantastic on this. The, the question is, well, what market? We have all these different classes of assets, and they all have these different powers and properties on the basis of effectively legal and political decisions. Some of them are convertible into cash directly. You know, you can basically just cash them in at the central bank. Other ones are not. Some of them have priority. You know, you get first, you're first in line when a, a there's a run on a firm, other ones don't. These are all legal decisions, they're political decisions. What justifies any of them? Well, to me, it has to be fundamentally, they all have to be justified in the context of a vision of what do we want our economy fundamentally to be like? What do we want our world fundamentally to be like? When we try to make decisions on the basis of these metrics, like GDP, or even if you come up with a new green growth metric, and the problem with central banks, I guess, is that they have to follow rules and rules have to be based on targets and targets have to be based on metrics like this. We can switch to nominal GDP if we want. We can put a financial stability target in if we want. 
but you know, I mean, I'm a firm believer in Goodhart's law when it comes to these things. As soon as you try to measure something using one of these metrics, the metric stops being of any use to you. You know, if you have a kind of uh, a GDP target, people will start uh, pushing up their profits, maybe. So you know, to to kind of try to manipulate the system that way. If you have a green growth target, people can try to manipulate uh, whatever you're using to measure emissions saved emissions and things so uh i don't i don't have like ideas about how you should design institutions but one thing i, I do feel is is there seems to be a big hole in the center of the conversation where some specific vision of what the aim we're, we're, we're trying to achieve should go you know the questions about how to instrumentalize it what, what sort of institutions we want to build to, towards this purpose have to, should surely come after. But I feel like sometimes we talk about which institutions we want to build, you know, should we give this power to the central banks? Well, well for what? I mean, what, what are we trying to do? Uh, that's, that's my feeling. Thank you. Um, Franklin? Franklin, yeah. So let, let me just tell you why it's called the Spanish flu first of all. So <laughs> after World War I, the vast majority of European countries had censorship and they, they stopped the newspapers talking about this flu. And the only, the only country that, that didn't was Spain because they didn't fight in World War I. So they had an uncensored press. So they were talking about the flu and how it was killing lots and lots of people. And so that's how it got to be called the Spanish I, I flu. Can do that, you know, il, il me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, so uh, you know, I think we as academics have a role to play in this process. It's not just governments. We have to come up with ideas and evidence and so on. And of course, you know, the kinds of books that that. Uh, uh, Alex and Katerina have written and, and, and the work Rod Rodrigo's done, they're all very important. It's trying to understand what are the alternatives and so on. And I think there, there are some fairly straightforward ones. You know, we still subsidize debt in huge amounts. We still have tax deductibility of interest. And there's, there's no good reason from that. You know, I mean, it's a historic, I my understanding it's a historical thing. If you're running a small business, then you, you pay wages and you pay interest to the bank, but they should both be tax deductible. But if you've got corporate finance view of the world, then, you know, why, why is interest tax, dedu is tax, tax deductible and dividends aren't, or those kinds of questions. So there are, lot, there are a fair amount of simple things that we can change like that. You know, there, there are fundamental issues about do you want to go towards banks to markets, banks versus markets. Those are things that we used to debate quite a lot at the turn of the century. Uh, they, they went away and that, that now, you know, it, that to some extent with capital markets union and banking union, there's someone back on the agenda in the EU, but, but not that much. But those are the kinds of debates I think we need to have to think about and they're, they're complicated debates. You know, markets have lots of wonderful features and banks do and that we really need to understand what exactly the trade-offs are, and, and, and that's very important. And we, you know, that, that isn't something for finance ministries or central banks. These are people that, that, that are dealing with problems which are often very short-term, and they don't often take, have a chance to go take a long-term vision. And I think that's our job as academics, is to debate those things and think about them and propose different alternatives and so on. Thank you very much. Uh, before I give the word to both Katarina and Rodrigo, let me also pose to them two questions which I thought were quite interesting and you have responded to them in the chat. So I will read them and for the interest that everyone knows that the two come from Cliff and uh, the first question just to Katarina is, in view of asset values having temporarily collapsed and debt to equity swaps being inappropriate, or for the moment, should there not be an initiative to convert cash pay debt into redeemable cumulative preferred equity, potentially with participating features? So that's one specific question, which is in the chat. 
And the other one, and it's again for, for the two of you, Katarina Rodrigo, this is, I think, quite a, a, an interesting question, moving again to the, to the world of sovereign debt, leaving the world of banking, corporate, and, and a household debt. Given that most listed bonds are based on New York and English law, isn't the starting point with the change of law sponsored by US and UK governments? So uh, when now you have the, the, the ability to answer to the two previous questions, if you can also say a couple of remarks about these two specific questions, that would be great. And I'll start with you, Katarina, and then Rodrigo. Thank you. So, you know, on the on the question about New York or uh, London, um, these are typically the jurisdictions that are used both for most of the tradable private assets, but also for sovereign bonds that are issued by emerging markets. It's it, if they don't use their own um, uh, their own law and their own currency, they typically use English law and, and New York law. Although not all do, and the, the variance across emerging markets um, is different. Um, you know what exactly these jurisdictions in England or New York should be doing is a different matter because um, you know these contracts, of course, um, take advantage of a lot of private autonomy that the contract laws of these jurisdictions provide, which is precisely why they have been used. So there's not an, an easy solution to that. And on top of that. Um, the investors and the underwriters might push then these countries to opt into another legal system that offers something that maybe New York or London would, would, would no longer do. So there's not a clear cut solution to that question. On the first one, I think we should you know, really think very um, hard about imaginative solutions to convert the current debt into something else that could be used productively in the future. And so that would be on the table. I think it would, would um, require greater thinking about, you know, Whose debt, you know, are we converting in this particular way? Who will hold it, and who who will know exactly what to do with these type of instruments? So, but I think it's productive. Uh, just in, you know, in general, on the points that we're talking about, um, and I think it's really important to think long term, medium term, and long term. I I try to say this in my remarks. We have to think about climate change. We have to think about the increasing volatility of our environment and we have to configure our economies to deal with them. And in that regard, I do find um, reliance on, on, on excessive debt, especially short-term, always refinanceable debt of, of, of uh, debt that, that relies on short-term refinancing, deeply problematic. So I think we have to, to um, put this definitely into, into the um, equation. Um, you know, this is also something in, in, with regards to green growth and, and, and green bonds. I think a lot of what we're currently doing when we, we're just greenwashing things is that that's what we're doing. It's not clear that we've come, come to the terms with the fact that we might not be able just, you know, they're binding constraints. They're normatively important discussions that we have. I agree with Alex. We have to think about what economies do we want. We also have to think about what economies can we have have given the predicament that we are in that has to be part of the debate and, and i think we academics have to try to lead that um, there is of course uh, the next step we have to then you know reach out to make sure that political leaders take that on as, as well as they um, try to form the, the public debates thanks rodrigo shall i take the floor okay uh, there are there are several things or themes uh, floating around. I would like to be very brief and, and as much as I can touch on, touch on all of them. Uh, one of the key, for me, one of the instrumental issues is that we don't have the luxury of time. And, and some of these big radical changes uh, unfortunately take time or and proper thinking through. So basically, I believe more in pragmatic bottom-up uh, small changes that, that can have real impact. And I think that that's where Cliff, uh, who I know well, he's a citizen of the world, basically he's suggesting this, uh, whether we should introduce changes on US, UK law. Uh, and I think that what would be even simpler than that, because even that I think that would not be as simple as to change uh, U.S. and U.K. law, I don't think it would be that simple. What would be simpler would be changing the contracts. Uh, and this is something that we have seen in the past in perfectioning some of the contracts by, for example, building in specific clauses that allow the majority to restructure the terms of debt obligations 
without having to resort to to a bankruptcy procedure, which makes it uh, way more expeditious and simpler. Uh, these are the type of, of things or changes that we can see, and, and for that you don't even need to change the law, which is a process in itself, it has a political cost, there are multiple ramifications. Uh, and, and basically, I think that we should be thinking both short term and long term, and another, another of the, of the, I think, one of the possible solutions, which basically it's not immediate for the, for the current scenario, but basically one of the things that I am proposing is the inclusion of interest holidays on debt instruments, where basically upon request of the debtor, you can automatically benefit from skipping one or two interest payments, which basically that provides the necessary giving, uh, the necessary breathing space. Uh, and, and I understand that basically this is an exceptional circumstance, but basically we have seen one, of course, not of the same magnitude, but one which was uh, quite uh, big and quite important, which was the, the EU sovereign debt crisis. And, and that was the perfect storm to adopt something along the lines of a statutory debt restructuring approach. And, and the solution on that occasion was to resort to contractual provisions. And this kind of allowed me to circle back to Cliff's question about changing US, UK law. And the problem that you will have there, the limitations you have there, and that's why I, I'm suggesting probably more going into simpler solutions like working on the contract than, than, than a statutory approach is that, for example, now uh, one of the big debt issues of the world is Italy. And uh, Italian uh, debt is not governed by, or most of it, it's not governed by neither English nor uh, uh, New York law. It's governed by Italian law. So basically, that, that, that's a clear example of, and, and yes, Cliff's uh, comment of changing UK US law, and I think that basically he's referring mainly to uh, bonded debt instruments, uh, that will apply mainly for emerging economies. But again, uh, I think that now we are in an unprecedented crisis that it's not affecting a specific type of economies or a specific type of industries. It's affecting the, the whole wide world. And that's why probably that might, might fall a little bit short. And that's why I think that probably a bottoms up approach working on the contracts can be simpler to implement and can have a wider reach beyond a specific jurisdiction. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. And really, the, the issue of private sector debt relief uh, remains on the table for emerging economies because the G20 was only talking about bilaterals and multilaterals. So what you said, going back to contractual solution, is interesting. There is, of course, also the opportunity to change the insolvency bill, which is currently being discussed to, to introduce some amendment that could contribute via legislative reform to achieve some of those results. My last question, we are going to aim to finish at 4.30. And my last question relates to the, to the one type of debt that we have not discussed very much. We have talked about household, to some extent corporate SMEs and sovereign debt, as well as the central banking debt, which has always a link to the sovereign. And, but we have not talked very much about bank debt and finance debt. So the final thoughts, the final round concerns bank debt, because after all, the banking system is used to provide the loans to the SMEs. So it's the network that the government is using to provide the notes guaranteed. And the asset managers are having also, you know, are going to have major trouble. So, so the, 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 the final question relates to bank debt, finance debt, any thoughts that you have brief each of you and I will start with Alex. Thanks. Um, I mean, I don't know very much really to say about this, except I guess this is where the moral hazard uh, issue probably is worth thinking about because um, banks you know, because banks are the arteries of the economy, because they're part of the public infrastructure, because they administer the payment system as well as doing these other functions, they are in a position to exploit moral hazard pretty easily, I guess. So um, 
banks know that they can uh, in many cases get out of having to uh settle their own debts themselves with the help of central banks simply simply because their, their, their existence is necessary to sustain the system but I, I mean i guess one thing that can happen i feel like this did happen a little bit after 2008 is um individual debtors don't get bailed out debtors to the banks don't get bailed out the banks do get bailed out but then what you have is you have effectively unpayable debts which stay on the books right which stay on the bank's balance sheet uh, the bank can manage it because the asset price isn't collapsing because a central bank is holding it up artificially has to do that so that the banks can continue to clear with each other they're not stuck trying to settle with you know assets that are effectively worthless but but the the debtors who are you know the people in the asset are stuck trying to service these unpayable debts um i i i feel like that's a scenario that could very easily play itself out again, um, but at a time when, when people are much more distressed. So, I mean, that's one thing. Thank you. People have said that this is the opportunity for the banks to rebuild their reputation, and there has been so much passion in the bankers after the crisis. So let's see if they take. Uh, uh, Franklin, if you would like to say a few. So the, the, the problem is if you if you, forgive debt from banks and intermediaries, you create a run problem, which, you know, is, is very devastating in itself. So, in fact, we have the opposite, where rather than forgiving debt, we get, you know, we have deposit insurance, which is guarantee for debt, and many other kinds of guarantees. So, I think forgiving, forgiving uh, bank, bank debt is something that's very problematic. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, you want to say some final thoughts on the issue of bank debt and finance debt? You're, uh, it's me, okay. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, um, I, I agree with Franklin that um, that this would be what would be a problem. I want to make a maybe a slightly broader point, if I may, is that I think you know we have created this um, uh, credit-based financial system, which I think links both banks and markets. So I think the division between banks and markets that Franklin was alluding to earlier is not as clear-cut anymore because in the end, uh, banks certainly before the crisis of 2008 have financed the shadow banking system with the credit line and um, in the CLO market, they're also deeply implicated um, these days. So they're, 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 they're really linked. I think a real problem is that um, you know the the credit creation for financial intermediaries of all kinds has become too easy um, and the credits have become too safe which then creates all um, the debt assets and 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 financial intermediaries very often find themselves on both sides of course of the stick that's part of the, them being intermediaries uh, so one can't really resolve one problem without the other and I think it really goes to the structure of the financial system so I, this is basically point that Carolyn Sissoko has, has made earlier is the is basically the legal backing of debt assets is such um, that um, it's become just an enormously lucrative financial asset that banks have churned out and other financial intermediaries have churned out and are sometimes taking on as their own assets and sometimes owing it to others. And um, you can't just re resolve the entire problem by resolving the debt problem alone, especially when it comes to the intermediaries. Thank you very much, Katarina. Rodrigo, final thought? Rosa, on the theme of banks, I am, uh, my main comment would be uh, my concern about their fragility. Uh, I see them at the moment as being kind of the ham in the sandwich because they will be squeezed from, uh, from the, the clients, MPLs, uh, on the balance sheet of the banks and also uh, at top down from uh, central government and and that uh, top down is a little bit uh, a double a double risk one is basically uh, some government might push banks to to hold government debt uh, and at the same time if banks get into difficulties uh, because of uh, MPLs or or any other issues, basically around the bank or whatever, uh, they 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 will have an exposure to the 
government and probably the government on top of that might not be able to to provide liquidity assistance if needed but uh, so basically my main reflection on, on banks in this whole uh, environment is basically I'm, I'm very much concerned about the, their fragility Thank you very much. We have reached uh, 4.30. I will invite Angus to say a final word and then I'll say the formal goodbye. So Angus, if you want Thank you. And uh, thank you very much indeed to you, Rosa, for such expert uh, chair personing. Uh, it was superbly done. And um, thank you very much indeed to um, each of the panelists, Rodrigo, uh, Katharina, uh, Alex and Franklin uh, for giving up your time and for making such um, valuable and fascinating contributions. You know, uh, uh, rebuilding macro sort of prides itself on supporting interdisciplinary research. And um, it's been fascinating here, different perspectives from the legal side, finance side, also philosophy side, which is too often left outside of the discussion here that there is a question of justice uh, somewhere. In, underneath this whole economic structure that we created. Um, I think that the main takeaway and where this is so consistent with what we try to look at is that behind all or underneath all economic systems are social foundations and they're frankly inseparable. And perhaps this one got stretched to a point where we need to think about what the economy is supposed to do for these people. And you know, since the time of Lionel Robbins, it kind of lost sight of that a little bit. It became a bit um, uh, a bit value free and perhaps we have to be brave enough to make it more value laden and think about some of the social foundations which are at the heart of all of what we do. So um, people who are listening please do go to our website it's rebuildingmacroeconomics.ac.uk. We are funded by the ESRC which we're very grateful for and we have the next our fifth um, exit strategy workshop next Wednesday so please do come along to that. And finally, thank you again to each of the speakers for great contributions. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, you uh, uh, thank you very much. And I will say thank you to all the participants. Sorry that this time, though you could talk via the chat, you couldn't talk physically, but I enjoyed very much the discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.